Uh, I thought in the brief time available to me, I shall, I should perhaps raise two or three issues which have pervaded some of the presentations this morning and perhaps give it a touch of another issue which has not pervaded very much, as much as it should have been. Uh, Fred Dalmeyer mentioned Einstein's tribute to Gandhi, the future generations would not believe that such a man as this walked the streets of the world, something like that. My favorite uh, homage to Gandhi was delivered by Arnold Toynbee. He said, henceforth, mankind will ask its prophets, are you, to will are you willing to live in the slum of politics? I think that's the difference. Gurus, sages, spiritual persons are dime a dozen in India. We have a surfeit of them, we ex export them all over the world. It, it's a good export honor for us. But they are not willing to live in the slum of politics. And that was his distinctiveness. Gandhi himself claimed that he has said nothing unique. Karl Deutsch put his name in along with that Mao as the only two Asian thinkers who have shaped political knowledge of the world. We don't have to go by that judgment, but Gandhi himself believed that he had nothing new to say. Whatever he had said was as old as humankind, as old as the hills, he put it that way. And there is perhaps some justification in that statement. Lake Valletta, the trade union leader in Dansk, in Poland, began to read Gandhi when he was called by the Poles Avar Gandhi. He didn't even know well who Gandhi was, but not perhaps the Polish people. But once his non-violence, once his non-violent resistance made sense to Poles, they invoked Gandhi. Mandela was a part of an armed revolutionary formation. He began to read Gandhi in jail when people began to call him South African Gandhi. And Benito Aquino started reading Gandhi when he was being acclaimed by the Filipinos as our Gandhi. So Gandhiism and Gandhi is within all of us, even us. Gandhiism is us. But hostility to Gandhi and Gandhism, hostility to what he represents too, is us. I, many years ago, I wrote, a, wrote an analysis of the assassination of Gandhi. And I showed the remarkable similarities between the life cycle of Gandhi and his assassination. They were both brought up in the same kind of austere patriotism, austere self-denial. Uh, uh, both of them had participated in the freedom struggle. And ultimately, the two clashed as they were bound to clash. And this assassin, when he was given his last say by the High Court judge, before the death sentence was pronounced on him, gave a moving speech justifying why he had to kill Gandhi. The assassin said that Gandhi was the father of the nation. But in crucial moments, he has failed my motherland. And as a dutiful son of Mother India, 
I had to kill him. I had great respect for him. That is why I bowed before him, before pumping in the bullets into him. I propose this because contrary to what Ravi Bhutalinga says, nearness can be very dangerous. The great enemies of epic times and of modern times too have invariably between characters where there have been some continuities between them, some connections, you know, between Karna and Arjuna in Mahabharata, between Ram and Ravana in Mahabharata, and so on and so forth. Nearness it can also be dangerous when it, once it ruptures. It is from that point of view I want to look at it, uh, look at this issue. Because the political twist to the story is this, that these are two possibilities, one of which we are afraid of as a temptation and a, sed and a seduction. That is why the attempt of every regime has been to denounce, whether it's Tolstoy or Gandhi, it doesn't matter, nor does it matter whether it's Blake or Thoreau. In each of their cases, they have tried to shell them by saying, all this is very nice, all this is very moral and ethical, but this is a romantic nostalgia for a pastoral paradise, which cannot be actualized in contemporary terms. The demands of statecraft, the demands of modern nationhood are such that we are logically moving towards this unfoldment and if we have to transcend this that will be have to be in the future at the moment to work with this and i believe that the main resistance to gandhism also comes from there it is not widely known that gandhism was tried against nazi germany once only once it was never given a chance to with <laughs> another struggle and that struggle, contrary to all popular beliefs of what you might think happened, was a success. This is the Rosen Strauss incident. Many people have written about it. There's a book on that. You can read that. The fear of Gandhism, or for that matter, the kind of utopia and visionary uh, concept of the future which the likes of Tolstoy, Blake, and Thoreau ventured. Gandhi, all, all the uh, three gurus of Gandhi, whom Gandhi referred to as his gurus, were Westerners, not Indians, not the, from the Indian classics, but from Western world. Tolstoy, he called himself his guru, uh, other guru was Thoreau, and the third one was, um, no, there were actually fourth one, uh, Gandhi, Emerson and Ruskin. Yeah. So, in any case, so the greatest fear is this, that you might slip towards it. You, so I, I, I now come to my second proposition and I will quickly wind up, don't worry about it. Uh, I think the main marker of modernity for those outside the Western world was a subtle shift in the fulcrum of ethics. Ethics traditionally in all societies were drawn both from reason and empathy or compassion. Sometimes in some societies, as in the Japanese case, it, uh, aesthetics also played an important role in ethics. But so did it in uh, many other countries also. But it's lesser though. This subtle balance was destroyed after the Enlightenment. Because ethics began to be exclusively supported by reason and the logic of, I mean, law, and the, I would say reason and what could be justified through reason and 
the main expression of that reason became scientific rationality and experimental laboratory. This was the measure of truth and this also became the measure of ethics. Science, it was supposed to be value neutral, but nonetheless, as far as ethics went, you were supposed to justify it through this. Now, this might have been a correction of the medieval emphasis on compassion and empathy. Might have been, I do not know. But ultimately, the logic of this overemphasis on rhythm had a certain trajectory. We all know them. Over the last 300 years, the most remarkable instances of Satanism in our world, in each case, was justified in the name of scientific rationality and truth. Whether it was the annihilation of the Native Americans, some figures who had as 120 million killed over a period of 150 years, or later on the four continent slave trade took to taking a toll of between 6 million and 12 million African lives according to different estimates. Whether it was modern colonialism as opposed to the, to the old style colonialism of France, uh, Portugal and Spain in the first kind of colonialism, pillage was the main target or goal. In the second kind of colonialism, civilizing mission was the other major, major target and it was, it was considered the white man's burden and its moral responsibility to civilize the rest of the world or whether it was the organized genocides and mass violence in many instances, including artificial famines in some cases. The fact remains that each case, the justification came from scientific rationality and scientific theory. Nazis were seen as the epitome of irrationality but the justification for their version of genocide came from eugenics, 19th century biology, and public hygiene. These were the principles they invoked. The uh, Lipton's work very clearly establishes that the slogan, the right to uh, destroy life, that is unworthy of life, was a, was a scientific principle. And that's the way the Nazi doctors who were complicit with the genocide had justified their act. What we see in Blake, Thoreau, Tolstoy, and Gandhi is a premature recognition of the demise of the post-enlightenment modernity founded on the principles of enlightenment, which in each case, we are complicit with these four major instances of mass violence. The responsibility and the complicity of scientific rationality being one of the most conspicuous one among them. It has been shown that Hiroshima was chosen because it was not a military target. The armed forces people who were represented in the committee which decided were for targeting a military target in Japan, but the scientists were keen on having a city which had not been touched by Allied bombing till now because the measurement would have been perfect of how much damage the nuclear weapon can do. It was a gigantic. Um, scientific experiment. I can do many other instances. There are a lot of such stories. The point I am trying to make that that is overcorrection in favor of reason. The likes of Gandhi opposed and they wanted to go back 
to the idea of the community and compassion and empathy to at least partly correct it. Future generations might consider it an overcorrection too in the other direction, but my feeling is this, that at this point of time, we are seeing the end of an age and that is the age of modernity. It cannot be said that bringing in the concept of alternative modernity, alternative modernity is like alternative development. I am in my mid-70s, I have seen many concepts of development, alternative development floating around, starting from the rural development, ethno development, alternative development, futuristic development, uh, egalitarian development and so on and so forth. At the moment the buzzword is sustainable development. I have seen all of them die an early death. The only development which survives is a development with capital D. I am afraid in the case of modernity too, the only modernity that survives is the modernity with capital M. It is the urban industrial civilization with the Chinese and the Indians are pursuing uh, without any limitations. Even the limitations which have come into the West do not obtain in the Eastern world. And one million Chinese and one million Indians are, uh, are dreaming that if they can live a virtuous life, then they won't go to heaven after death, they will go to New York. <laughs> so, no, this is the world in which we live, where 40% of the world thinks that way. I think it is time we begin to see the works of the men we are celebrating here as precursors of a new age. I don't want to call it post-colonialism, that term has been hijacked uh, for clear views in literary theory. I want to leave it to the next generation to name the age, but there is, there are signs of another kind of world which is opening up. Uh, at Gandhi's time, there was not a single country didn't, which ha didn't have an army. Uh, at the moment, there are 14 countries which does not have an army. Uh, this, you know, Europe's sharper edges of uh, the nation state system has. Uh, has, 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 been, has been blunted or uh, softened in Europe already. Uh, but on the other hand, I notice that both in India and China, the traditional 19th century nation state has come back to rule the roost in the 21st century. Uh, it's a mix of the optimistic and the pessimistic. I am optimistic. I think we are in the face world of another, another kind of consciousness, another kind of awareness. We are less defensive about being called romantic utopians and visionaries. Uh, here are in this room many people who have been involved in that kind of ventures. And I do believe that ultimately we shall try. If I may end it by saying a brief story, uh, I will do so because ultimately what I have spoken and said is a kind of a reform on a new, uh, of an age, modernity. And perhaps also a modernity's main instrument, science and technology. Uh, it is our Francis Bacon, the one who talked of science as power. It seems that one wintry evening, Sir Francis, very eager to test out what happened if you force feed a chicken with ice, uh, what will be the result? No, I could have told him, told him the result, but he didn't. He wanted to know that result experiment. So he took out a chicken uh, uh, outside in the lawns of his house and began to force feed him with the ice that had, uh, uh, snow that had fallen. He was force feeding the chicken with snow. The chicken, of course, dutifully died, but Sir Francis got pneumonia and died himself after a few days. Uh, with that, partly optimistic, partly <laughs> pessimistic ending, I leave it to your thoughts. Yeah.